everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the honor and pleasure of chatting with New Jersey's own John J.D. DeServio. Yeah! <laughs> What's happening, Raul? Oh, not much. Just trying to, try to stay afloat. So, right on. I hear that, man. As always, we like to go back to the past, things Ooh. that people may not know much about. How did you get started in music and on bass? Oh man, I was I was a young kid, man. I had older brothers, right? So I loved music because they had, you know, Jethro Tull rocking, Black Sabbath, Zeppelin, The Doors, you know. So I dug music at an early age, and I remember in third grade, I thought like Jethro Tull was the best band in the world because remember their song, uh, what uh, locomotive breath? He said, "Got him by the balls." I was like, "Oh my god!" He said, "Balls!" It's so cool, right? Yeah. Eight years old, <laughs> and then uh, so my buddy's like. Kiss is my favorite band. I said, Kiss? Who, who the hell's Kiss? And he showed me that picture of them on the Empire State Building. I said, they're the best. So that was it. I knew from then on that I wanted to be Gene Simmons and do that. And that was it, man. Very so cool. They, and they, you know, obviously they inspired millions, you know, and I was one of them. Mm-hmm. Sure. Are you self-taught or did you pursue classes or what? Um, it, well, no, I had some lessons early on when we were like fifth grade. My guitar player was taking lessons, you know, and uh, he would show us. Like the first three licks I learned was like, walk this way, mm-hmm. uh, that jailbreak, dan, 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 and uh, Sweet Home Alabama. Yeah. Bum, bum, bam, bum, bum, bum. And they were the first three things I learned. And then I studied like in, in high school, like music theory classes and stuff. And then I wound up going to Berkeley College of Music after that. Oh, nice. So, but up until Berkeley, I was pretty much self-taught, you know, and then like music theory in school. But man, then at Berkeley was just an amazing experience, man. Wow. Phenomenal. Yeah. Wow. Well, I couldn't believe I could go to college for four years for music. Because I was a kid bugging out. I knew I wanted to be a musician, you know. And my singer, or my drummer at the time, his sister was going to Berkeley and told us about it. And I was like, are you serious? I was like, I'm going, I'm going <laughs> if I can, you know. So I wound up getting accepted, and yeah, man, it was just an amazing, amazing experience, man. Very nice. And I think a lot of people, when they think of Berkeley, they think more kind of in the jazz, but there, right. there is a lot of prog. There's a lot of rock that comes out of Berkeley. Oh, yeah, totally. And when I was there 100 years ago, you know, because I'm old, so <laughs> we had the first heavy metal ensemble. They oh, actually wow. made this class, heavy metal, uh, yeah, whatever it was, heavy metal ensemble. So we performed in a performing arts center, all this. All the purists hated us, you know, they hated metal and rock. <laughs> They're playing their 335 guitars all up here, you know what I mean, and stuff. Cop and chords, and, and we're playing Ingve licks and, you know, Maiden stuff. And, you know, it was it was awesome, man. So, yeah, definitely. I didn't even realize it was like a jazz school, you know? Mm-hmm. So I just thought it was a music college. I had no idea that they, they were like the best jazz school in the country. So I just, I took it and ran with it, man. I, I love jazz and funk music and you know fusion i've always liked that stuff never really heard it much you know i mean when i was a kid i did dig uh al dimiola that was like my introduction kind of into the fusion world a little bit yeah. but i can understand him a little bit more because he was like you know more diatonic you know because i heard jocko when i was like 13 or 14 i was like i had no idea what the, what the hell that was <laughs> you know what i mean i was like i don't know what this is man it was sounded amazing but i'm like i forget that i couldn't even comprehended at that age you know but totally. then later on i obviously you know i got a grasp of it and and uh yeah it, it was all awesome man early on it was a lot of rock though man lots of rock very nice well and again it is berkeley is one of the schools has been very progressive even embracing electric bass because there's still schools cool. that yep. would stick with purely upright uh-huh and in i i, I glimpse of what we're going to talk about a little bit in the future the latest video that I saw, you were on Upright. And I'm like, whoa. Yeah, that was just a video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. But anyway. I have an Upright. Put it that way. Okay. I have one. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah. we've seen you so much with Black Label Society. Yeah. How did that all come about? Wow. We're talking, my God, 1986 is when me and Zach met. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's we go back a long way. Can't believe I'm still friends with the guy, but you know, what, what are you going to do? <laughs> anyway, but man, we, we hooked up, you know, his band was playing 
in a local club by my house. I heard about this hotshot guitar player. I went down to see him. I was like, wow, this guy's ripping, man. I met him. We went downstairs in a dressing room where we were just jamming. We had one little gorilla amp. He was playing leads and I'm playing rhythms. Then he'd give me the chord and I'd play leads and he would play rhythms. And uh, ever since then, man, we just, you know, we became, you know, great friends and, and brothers, man. We were into Al Demiola, Randy Rhodes, you know, Randy, huge, you know, and uh, and all the cats. And uh, that's that's what linked us together, man. And we're still here, man. You know, great, great. Well, and the, to have stability with a group, you really it really does help if you can be friends and, and get along. And wow, it's so crazy, man. So many bands like hate each other. Yeah. Brothers like the Black Crows, Oasis, <laughs> all these bands, the Kinks, they all hated each other. Yeah. Like, Man, they must be assholes, man. I don't know. <laughs> well, it you spend more time together as a band than you do with like even family. If you think about like it's our extended family, you know, out here yeah. on the road. You know, you're living with twelve other people, you mm-hmm. know? And if you don't get along, man, it's it's a long trip. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. So I uh, think we're very lucky in that regard where, you know, we all totally get along. You know, me and Zach said like we've known each other forever, you know, and and, uh, and uh, Jeff and Dario came into the band like seven years ago now. We're all brothers, man. You know, it, it's it's really awesome. And all the crew is, is great. So, you know, it's definitely family, man, you know. Very nice. Yeah. And looking at, with with so much of, of the music and the things, you guys have a new album getting ready to drop. Doom yeah. Crew Incorporated, I think that's set for Black Friday. Interesting. Yes, sir. <laughs> interesting target date. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about this album. It's been done for a while now. It's just you know another one in the in the you know in the in the list of black label. I think people, the, our fans are gonna love it. I like where we've been going with our music. You know, it's progressively getting you know. I think they're better songs, man. People love the old songs, and I do too. Mm-hmm. But I really dig this new record a lot. I love Grimmest Hits. I really, you know, me and Zach always say it like. Since like 2010, Order the Black, that was like our second chapter of Black Label. Because that's when me and Zach really took over recording, producing, and mixing the records and stuff. So I've been doing it forever. I've been telling him to get a studio forever and ever. And in 2009, he actually built, he made the guest house a studio. And it's, it's dope as hell. It's just awesome. So uh, we've been doing the records there at his, at his place mm-hmm. since, for the last 11 years. And they're just steadily and sonically getting better. His songwriting is, is just getting better. It's really cool because a lot of times, you know, these older bands, they put out records and nobody cares. It's like, let's just hear this stuff from 20 years ago. Yeah. But in our case, it's kind of, you know, I think our new stuff is really is really some of our best, man. Mm-hmm. And uh, the fans like it. I, I can see the reaction. They, they've been digging it. And the crowds are getting younger. We're getting older. Yeah. We're getting younger, so that's good. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it sounds great. Another one that we produced and mixed, you know, at Zach Studios. I don't even know how many we've done now. There are probably six or seven, including like the Book of Shadows stuff and all kinds of other things. So we love it, man. It's definitely a good good place to be. Very nice. Well, it's got a lot of interesting versatility. And again, I think yeah. when people think yeah. sometimes with metal, you'll kind of go, okay, this one sounds like the last one. This sounds like the next one. But yeah. even on Set You Free, the opening's kind of renaissance medieval sounding and i'm Without like a doubt, right right is that you know what zachy they studied classical years ago man you know when we were kids he still has that you know that's why he can chicken pick so good you know uh you know with his solos and stuff uh-huh. like with this hand because he would man he was his classical playing was amazing he abandoned it like when he joined ozzy he kind of just abandoned a lot of things because he wanted to be himself because, you know, Ingve Randy, you know, Blackboard, he already did the neoclassical kind of thing. So he's like, I don't want to do that. He's like, what can I do that just makes me sound like me? So he went the pentatonic route and the chicken picking route. And, and here we are today. So it, it's it's cool, man. Yeah, that's definitely like like some classical stuff, which we'll have in the record reminiscent of like Randy, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that. And then but then the tune is just rocking, just a hard rock driving tune. Oh, yeah. And a, and a great video. Very serious. Well, and as, as you mentioned the videos, it seems like there's a lot of uh, very interesting things. I've seen kind of the, tre- the trend where the band plays on and the crowd kind of destroys themselves. So yeah, it was pretty funny. <laughs> Watching it was pretty amazing, I got to say. It was it, awesome. Very entertaining. And I think seven people died, but it's okay. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> And what is your process coming up with bass lines when you're doing this? Kind of, how do you go about it? 
man, it's just, you know, we love music. You know, we've been doing it for so long. The second I hear the riff, I'm either going to go with the riff for the most part or I'll counter it. I'll ride maybe, I won't play the riff, I'll just ride the eighth notes and then add a little bit to it here and there. On the ballads is when I really get to really do more bass lines, you know what I mean? Because there's a lot of chords, so there's a lot of walking room, you know what I mean? I could do some nice lines here and there. But with the metal stuff, it's pretty much, you know, you gotta stick to the to the form there, you know what I mean? You gotta stick to the riff. But I, I get to throw in some stuff. Live is a completely different story. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, oh my God, I, I, yeah. I get made by the note, that's why I play so much live, you know? <laughs> that's when people say, God, my God, you play so much, I'm like, I know. <laughs> there you go. I'm having fun, man. It's just a blast up there, you know? Nice. And do you draw inspiration from other bassists you have? I, you mentioned Gene Simmons and, and all these guys. Yeah. I, I, I draw inspiration from, like, anybody, really. Singers, drummers, Oscar Peterson, man. I mean, you name it. You know, there's so much great music out there, so many great musicians. Like I said, I've been a bass player you know, I got a bass in sixth grade. Like, I knew I wanted to play bass, you know what I mean? And like, bass? Why do you want to play bass? I'm like, because Gene Simmons played bass. I'm like, that's it. I wanted to do that. Yeah. You know, I, I always loved singers and, you know, and piano players and stuff. So, like, James Brown, I love Sly and the Family Stone. Like, all these great singers, Joe Cocker. I mean, I I burned through cassettes, you know mm -hmm. what I mean, when we had cassettes. I bought, like, several of, like, James Brown in the Jungle Groove and all kinds of things. So I'll draw inspiration from any, any great musician, man, you know, pretty much. And Zach inspires me. Yeah. He inspires the shit out of me, you know, and he's killing it. So I'm like, I got it. I got to kill it just as hard as him, if not harder, you know? So it's it's pretty awesome. I, I don't have to look far for inspiration, you know? There you go. Well, they, they often say, if you want to be good, play with people that are better than you. Always. And it'll push. And I always do, because I suck, you know? So <laughs> they're always better than me. As we talk about sound, we need to talk a little bit about gear. How are you getting your sound? What are you playing on? Well, my I have Schechter basses, right? I have my own signature model. Mm -hmm. And I just came out with a signature model jazz bass, which is dope. I love that. DR strings, EMG pickups, Harky. I use like the Kilo, which is discontinued now, but I love that head. And the LH1000 head, I use a, a, a Samson Power Amp, 3200 watts. Mm -hmm. I use a couple pedals, not much, just like... A, an MXR kind of DI distortion thing, and like a Federa preamp, and I just kind of have a couple of different channels, you know, so like when I'll step on the, well, when my tech steps on the distortion for me, yeah. only the one side changes. So the other side always stays clean. Because with bass, if you if you distort it all, you, you lose the low end to me, and a lot of the, the meat, you know what I mean? A lot of the mid-tone, that clean that gets through. So I'll, I'll uh, have just like, a dual sound kind of thing and only one side changes with the effect and the other side stays clean so it's punchy i like it to be, you know to be punchy all the way through man. gotcha and that's basically it it's really pretty simple you know not it, much and one element that a lot of times especially with live performing a lot of people don't instrument cables are you guys doing wireless or are you yeah i've been uh samson wireless for years that's how i got with the company i i was um man when i got back in black label in 05 Zach used Samson Wireless. I mean, when I was in Pride and Glory, I had a Samson Wireless from Zach. Mm -hmm. And he's been thanking them on all his records since. Wow. And he didn't even use it. He didn't <laughs> use wireless, right? So in 05, uh, the company got in touch with me. And I said, yeah, you know, would you like to, you know, come down and, you know, try some stuff? And I was, I was using their wireless. I was like, no problem, you know? So I didn't even realize that Samson was Sam Ash. Which is, and they were distributing Harky mm -hmm. and Zoom and all that stuff at the time. And I remember going to the factory and uh, they're like, What do you think of that? And I was just there for the wireless, right? <laughs> so they go, What do you think of this Harky amp? I said, it Sounds good, but shit, I blow that up in two minutes, man. I can't use that. He's like, Really? Why? I'm like, Well, there's no headroom for me. You know, I need a lot of headroom because I'm playing with all these heavy metal dude freakos. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? This, their, their sound is so thick and loud. I'm like, I blow that shit up in one minute. I'm like, who are you? He goes, I designed it. I'm like, oh god. <laughs> so, but they were so cool, and they loved what I said because it was valid. I mean, I was just like, I just need it to be more. I need it louder. Yeah. You know, I was like, let make it hang with an SVT cabinet. You know what I mean? Whatever. 
So then we started working on stuff, which I was, it was I was in amazement. Like they were actually listening to my ideas, and then uh, we developed the heart, the high drive speakers, which were like you know 250 watts a speaker. So four tens is a thousand watts of power. So you can really push them, mm -hmm. you know. So and that's what I said. I was like, you know, let's just keep it rocking, so like we can compete with the SVT. Because up until then, Harky was like a lot of like jazzers, you know, and and funksters, you know what I mean? Yeah. No metalers, you know. It wasn't much metal there until I until I came in, you know. And then now they have a bunch, but that was my big thing with them. And then they they made the uh, the kilo head, which I love. They discontinued that. I wish they wouldn't have. But the LH one thousand is a great head too. Very simple, like the Alemic preamp, I believe they modeled it after. Just like a tr treble, mids, and bass, and that's really it, you know? Yeah. A lot of things crazy, because we, we have treble, mids, and bass on my bass. I got it on the amp, you know what I mean? It's just like, sometimes it can get to be too much, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but I like it. It's very simple, and um, like I said, I drive it with a power amp, so it's ultimate headroom, now. Nice, nice. Yeah. Well, and the whole, the whole issue with EQ, and again, I... I get it from the point of view, like if you're woodshedding at home and you want to kind of play with how things are sounding, but yeah. from tune to tune to know where you want it set and tweedling with knobs. And like you said, if it's on your bass or it's on, I, I know. I, yeah. Yeah. I find a sweet spot and I leave it there. And, that's and, it. And, that's and what so, we do. I, yeah. I don't even touch it. Yeah. We set it up, you know, at like at the rehearsals, then the first couple sound checks we'll do. I'm like, it sounds ripping every night, dude. Yeah. My shit is so ripping. I got my amp behind me. I got monitors in front of me and then the side fill on the right of me. So I'm in like a little triangle of, of bass heaven. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And drums or whatever else I put in there. But True. oh, I, it's ripping, dude. It sounds good, man. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. And as we look ahead, we're coming kind of on the tail end of the pandemic. You guys are touring as we speak. Yes. Not good. We were all good, man. What are the yeah. plans for the future? What's in the in the works? I know we have the yeah, album global release. Global domination. Yeah. Global domination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got, um. well, we're going to finish this run out. It goes up until December, I believe. And then I don't think we're going to be going out until 2022, but we have like, I think, five months planned already. Nice. Like Europe, festivals, America, Canada, you know, because we haven't been there. And we do great in Canada. Our Canadian fans are awesome. Uh, so we'll hopefully we'll do a whole tour from like Vancouver all the way over to Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. You know, we still got to do South America. We have to go to Europe. All the festivals are like in June, July, you know. So we're going to be busy next year. So nice. that, that's going to be awesome. Yeah, we just got to get through this year, man, you know. Well, it's that's it's it. been a long time coming. So the crowds are anxious to see the performances. Wow. I mean, it's got to be great. great to be getting out there again. It's so awesome to see everybody again and to do what we do. You know, I'm so blessed. I mean, to to do this for a living, it's it's insane. I'm, you know, I'm so happy and blessed, man. It's it, we all are. You know, the fans have been great. They're all turning out like nothing. It's just like nothing ever happened. You know, mm -hmm. I mean. Although a million, you know, a lot happened, but yeah, you know, but from where I see, it looks pretty jamming, you know. Nice. Yeah. And if people want to stay on top of what you guys are doing, so they can kind of see if you're going to be near them, the best place to look would that be BlackLabelSociety.com. That's a good one, you know. And then also Instagram. Okay. You know, we all have Instagram accounts. You know, John J D De Servio, you know, Dario Lorena, Jeff Fab, and Zach Wild B L S. We always posting up the gigs and the dates and stuff. Or you can just go on and click on it and just, you know, go through the posts or the pictures. And we always put the pictures up of, of all the dates and things like that. Or you can just Google the dates, you know what I mean? So, but we're, we're pretty good with that. We're all, we're, we're on all the time. There's not much else to do out here, you know? There you go. There you go. Well, JD, we appreciate you taking time to chat with us, to share oh, your journey pleasure, and your music. Folks, you've seen him here. John J.D. DeServio, coming to you live on Bass Musician Magazine. <laughs> Thank you, Raul, so much, my brother.